Don't settle for any ordinary brand. Let Jerry Foster, the branding evangelist, show you how to have a world-class brand here on Big Brand Formula. No more spinning your wheels, wondering what it takes to have a great brand that can have great things happen for you. Jerry wants you to think big and go big. Through his interviews and inspiring teachings, each episode is devoted to giving you the guidance, support, and tools for big branding your business, product, or a service, or even yourself as a personal brand. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Jerry Foster. Okay, welcome everybody to the Big Brand Formula Podcast. I'm Jerry Foster, the Big Branding Guy, also known as the Branding Evangelist. And as you know, one of the things that I'm committed to is bringing you the best of the best of the folks that I come across in their various fields of expertise, especially when I have an opportunity to connect with people who are out there doing extraordinary things with their lives. And such a person is our guest today. And I got to tell you, this young lady is setting the world on fire. And so it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce you to Yvonne Heath. Now, before I bring Yvonne on, let me just tell you a little about her. She has been a registered nurse since 1988, and she has worked in the United States and Canada, where she lives, by the way, in many areas, including emergency intensive care, chemotherapy, and hospice. Hmm. Yvonne became disheartened by our society's reluctance to talk about, plan, and prepare for grief and life's challenges, causing excessive suffering in life and at the end of life. And she suffered too, not knowing how to do it differently. And so in 2015, she took a leap of faith. She left her nursing career and blazed a new trail by helping us prepare before, key word, before, she brings heart and humor to grief and life's challenges. Yvonne is exceptional. She shares her message as an inspirational speaker with her book, Love Your Life to Death, as a television and radio host and through social media. In 2019, Yvonne delivered her TEDx talk, Transforming Grief by Just Showing Up. I love that title. Mm -hmm. Married to her best friend, Jordy, and mother to three amazing children, they are sharing their message with the world and helping great organizations along the way. So please welcome Yvonne Heath. How you doing, Yvonne? Oh my goodness. After that introduction, I'm doing amazing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to record that and, and share it with everyone. <laughs> well, I tell you, I, I first have to commend you not only about the work that you do, but your colorful background, because whenever I see someone who really has their brand visualized in such a way, because it says a lot about yourself, right? Is there anything special about why you chose the background colors and everything? I mean, it's really, it's really great. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, it's so I, with bringing a message of, uh, when we're talking about planning and preparing for grief and life's challenges, I kind of have to be a little light and thank goodness I'm really funny, right? <laughs> thank goodness, because you have to bring heart and humor, otherwise people are already running the other way. And and so as I continue to, you know, I of course you have to leap out of your comfort zone when you have a, a message that you want to share with the world and you don't have that experience. Um, but one of the greatest things that um, that changed my nursing career was watching the movie Patch Adams. And I know many people, yes, right, Jerry? I love many that movie, people. one of my all time favorites. And me too, absolutely. And uh, for those who don't know, Patch uh, is it's a movie, um, Robin Williams, who lives in my heart forever, uh, played a doctor, Patch, who brought joy and clowning to people on their, who were suffering the most on their worst day. And so that changed the trajectory of my nursing career. So I became that funny, silly nurse who brought humor to chemotherapy and everywhere. It's already serious enough. Yeah. And, uh, and most recently, because one of the good things that happened in COVID was my television show became, we're doing it by Skype. So I could interview people 
and I interviewed the real Paj Adams. Oh, <laughs> and it was oh, so oh. extraordinary. And I wanted my background to be patch worthy. <laughs> and so I, you know, I love having toys and the elephant is always in the room, if, even if it's disguised. And so I brought it out a bit more silliness than usual. And then I thought, you know what? I am leaving this because the best compliment I ever got was being called the Canadian Patch Adams. And I thought, I'm going to leave it because it's already serious enough, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. Well, tell us a little bit more about your journey in terms of how you got into doing what you do. Mm, it's uh, just that's quite a story, I understand. Thank you. Well, it, it's, it's so interesting because it's like in the first half of my life and all the experience that you, you have, you kind of think, you know, why don't I quite fit in? I feel like a square peg and, you know, trying to fit in the round hole and, and I don't, I can't quite settle in my nursing career and I moved a lot and I, I had a lot of experience. But I realized that in, in helping people navigate through their suffering and being with them on their truly the worst day of their lives, right? When, I mean, accidents and, and diagnosis and people dying, tragedies, I was trying to comfort them and I truly didn't have coping skills and strategies myself. Mm. And so I suffered excessively, but quietly, right? You, you, the polite conversation. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. And, you know, just trying to glue your pieces back together without complaining because you're the professional, right? You're, you're there to help everyone else. Uh, and then in, in when my, our older son was 16, uh, he had tremendous loss for a 16-year-old. He was an avid snowboarder, just loved snowboarding. He, he may have been professional, and he had a, a severe knee injury. And his, he couldn't drive, and he couldn't snowboard. And, and I believe that was the tipping point. He went down a very dangerous road of drugs and addiction. Mm. As a mother... I was falling apart, you know, that I could not control what my child was going through. And I knew, I felt in my heart and soul that I would not survive a tragic ending. Thankfully, I did not have to. My son, he turned his life around. However, in that moment, I was falling apart. I was working as a nurse, pretending I was fine, but people were avoiding me because it was such a challenging oh, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, ooh, Yvonne's son, and they're going through all this stuff. So people avoided me, not because they weren't compassionate, because they didn't feel like they had the skills themselves. And so that, it was either, it was kind of like hitting that emotional rock bottom, Jerry, where I thought I either can stay down here and suffer or create change within my own life and help others do the same. And that was the catalyst. It really was. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. So when you're helping people through whatever they're going through, what are some of the typical areas and I should say concern that people are facing and what are they bumping up against where they look to you for what comfort and guidance and inspiration? What are some... Uh yeah, it, it's so interesting because this is a time where there's just like a multitude of things going on in this global grief with this pandemic in particular, right? People, people are, are suffering so many different losses. And, and what I try to help people understand, at first people thought, oh, you're talking about grief. Oh, you, you're talking about death and end of life. And, and I try to help people understand, yes, that is certainly a time we grieve. Mm -hmm. However, grief is something that we experience in all loss transitions and change and it affects us mentally physically and emotionally and so people are realizing as i'm sharing my message and helping people to understand we experience grief mm -hmm. in divorce diagnosis job loss mental health issues right yeah. <laughs> your child having an addiction and going <laughs> there's huge grief and so the floodgates have kind of opened because people come to me and are seeking that like, it's so amazing. People are seeking support because sadly, often the people in their circle are just too afraid to have those conversations. The reason being is that everybody wants to fix it. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to make it better. And they're like, well, I don't know how. 
And so in interviewing hundreds of people mm -hmm. and sharing their stories of different journeys of grief, what I realized, and, and I heard more than anything else, people say, I don't know what to do and I don't know what to say. Oh my goodness. And so that, they avoid. So they avoid, exactly. They just, they just stay away because they don't know what to do, don't know what to say. So that was part of how you created what hashtag I just showed up. Tell us about that. Oh my goodness. Well, and it's so interesting because when I was writing my book and it's hilarious, anybody out there who has passion and purpose, if you don't feel qualified to create a big brand, to create a message, I promise you, you're qualified because I didn't have a clue what <laughs> I was doing. I was not an author or a speaker, but passion and purpose kidnapped me. And so listen to that passion and purpose. Um, but when I wrote my book and people kept coming to me with their stories of being in the deep trenches of grief and finding joy again, I it changed my life. And, and I interviewed people ages 11 to 101 and shared their stories and my um, experience. And I, I feel like my book and like my audio book, every adult should listen to it because someone will relate to one of the stories. But I also wanted to connect with children and help people realize yes. that you are able, when you say, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, age, race, culture, sexual orientation, economic situation, we can all make a difference. And so we created the movement, the I just showed up movement, uh, right? Uh, and, and I just showed up teaches people of all ages how to just show up for themselves and others so they are empowered and resilient when grief arrives. And the mantra, when you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable, and you can't fix it. Mm. The magic answer, three words, just show up. Oh, I love that. I love that as show your up. brand message, exactly, because like you said, grief and loss are a part of life. They cannot be avoided forever. But as you put it, if we can learn to take good care of ourselves and each other, we can do what, Yvonne? We can get through it with less suffering, right? Absolutely. My mission is not about avoiding grief. It is about understanding and embracing and allowing grief and avoiding excessive suffering because we compound our suffering when we do not just show up for ourselves and just show up for each other. Yes. Right? We, we, and, it, and it is critical. It is critical to step back. We are all in charge of our own happiness, our own coping skills and our own strategies. And when we do take good care of ourselves and not make self-care a buzzword, we can just show up for others. Exactly. Because like you said, it's time for change. We can do better. And one of the things that struck me about your brand is that your, your brand, the work that you're doing is for everyone regardless of age, race, culture, sexual orientation, economic situation, ability, disability, right? You're teaching people of all ages and all types to do what? Just show up for themselves. Man, oh man, how, how, do, how do people respond to you? Because you're doing something that's very fresh. I've mm -hmm. never heard of anybody else doing something like this, right? Which I love because I'm always preaching and teaching the importance of having what? A standalone brand. Mm -hmm. brand, there's no one else like me who's doing the kind of work that I do. So tell me a little bit about that. Are they uncomfortable? Do they shy away? They're like, ooh, I don't know. Do you know what's so funny is <laughs> I kind of feel like the I just showed up movement. I, I kind of was sneaking in the back door so that we can prepare for grief, death, and dying. Because uh, when I when I talk about death and dying, you see people, right? They're just running. I don't want to talk about this, <laughs> right? And and so it's, it's like a, a gentler way to say, I understand. However, like you say, grief is a part of this journey. That means you have lived and you have loved and you have lost and life is messy. And, and if we can talk about plan and prepare for grief, death and dying, we will have a better chance of getting through this journey we call life with less suffering. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing, Jerry, about when you say like, how do people respond? When I, I teach children what, how to just show up and they get it, it's simple just show up. I don't know what to say, but I'm here. That's really sad. Mm. This is uncomfortable. Allowing your humanness, right? So I, 
it's like I let people off the hook. It is not your job to fix it. You can't fix grief, but you can love and support people along the way, and you don't need a PhD. Just show up in your messiness. Mm. Allow your humanness. Mm. You don't have to have the answers. And, it, and you're right. It doesn't matter what people are facing. The answer is always the same. Just show up for yourself first and just show up. My God. So you're not only inspiring people, you're empowering them. You're showing them how to tap into their own resilience, their own innate ability to get through anything, right? Regardless of what may be in front of them. How do you do that? Do you equip them with tips and tools? And, and is it mindset work? What exactly do you do? This brain of mine never stops spinning, Jerry. I have to tell you. <laughs> the squirrel mind, the squirrel mind, right? <laughs> I, and, and it's funny because I just love your questions and because you so get it. And, and in the culmination of my 27 years of nursing experience, the last five and a half years of interviewing hundreds of people, I came up with takeaways that I share with everyone. And I always say to people, you can follow me on my website and you get the seven takeaways with a brief description. I believe with all my heart and soul that those seven takeaways are truly the principles that you can, if you learn, follow and teach by example, you can find the absolute keys to living life to the fullest, learning to grieve and support others. And yes, maybe having that talk about end of life before it arrives and diffuse the fear. What? And then create more joy and happiness in your life. Then just get to living. <laughs> but like you said, people can't fix it. So what can they do? Can you share some of those principles? Because I'm sure some of our listeners and viewers are wondering in the face of those types of, of challenges with grief and loss and all the things that come along with this thing called life. They're wondering what exactly can I do? Anything you can share right now in terms of some key tips and thoughts? Absolutely. Well, the first thing when, when people don't know what to do and they just show up, what makes the biggest difference? Uh, and honestly, people, we, we underestimate and, and undervalue kindness and just showing up with small gestures. Hug, text, well, hug, you know, virtual hug right now, but hug, text, email, call, sit silently, keep checking in with people, put it in your calendar. Once a week, I'm checking in, how are you doing today? If you're not comfortable with that, help with the tasks of daily living. Because even in your, in your trauma, stress, grief, crisis, the rest of life keeps going. Wow. So walk the dog, cut the grass, pick up kids, bring food, um, those things where you just don't even feel like you can, can do it. And here's a beautiful, I'll give you one little tip and I know you're going to say, oh my goodness, that's gorgeous. One lady said when her dad died, she was so grief stricken, they were so close and she had to go to his house. It was winter and she had to go, you know, on whatever, sort things out. She got to her dad's house, she walked up and the, the path and the stairs had been shoveled and there was a little note that said, I shoveled the walkway in memory of your dad. Oh. <laughs> it's that simple. What? She said, she, she, it was beautiful. She's still talking about it 10 years later. Oh, God. So anyone can make a difference. Anyone can help and soothe the souls of someone else, right? I mean, my God. Anyone. And, and you know, the, the simplicity, I always tell people that great brands are simple to understand, right? People get it. Just show up. That's real clear. I love that. And so people... And so how do you help people get past their own inhibitions around this whole thing called, this is awkward, this is not me, I'm not the kind of person that's going to, you know, show up and, and, and hug and walk their dog and bring coffee. I don't want to cry with you. Oh, my God. You know, can we just, you know, can we chat? I mean... People have to get past their own, like you said, uncomfortableness, break through their own barriers 
so that they can indeed help someone get through their barriers. Oh my goodness. Two things so true. Don't wait for it to be comfortable because <laughs> it's Come not. Come on. People, people are waiting. They're like, oh, it's so uncomfortable. Say, so, yes, it is. Just show up anyway. And if they're truly, if you're thinking, oh, my gosh, I just can't show up. I'm going to cry because people say to me, what if I cry? I say, well, get yourself a tissue. <laughs> what if I make them cry? I say, we'll cry together. <laughs> right? People said I was a grief expert. I said, I was, yes, I'm very good at being a hot mess. And why? Because it's sad. So I'm going to cry. And the other thing is, if these are things I, I, I can't do this, this, or this, then what can you do? Mm. Then what can you do? Because it is always better to do or say something than to do or say nothing because you end up feeling so guilty. Yes. For avoiding. And then you're suffering and they're suffering. And it's this whole, we create our own excessive suffering. Oh. That is so powerful. We create our own excessive suffering. We and you know, it's, it's interesting you should say that because I think part of human nature is we, when we see someone going through a tough time because of grief or loss, we want to give them their space, right? We don't want to intrude. We don't want to invade into whatever's going on with them because we feel that's the polite thing to do. What you're getting to is that it's okay because that person may be reaching out for that, that, that hug, that touch, that whatever. However, they're not going to extend themselves. So we have to take it upon ourselves mm. to be a little assertive, right? Absolutely. And most people that I have talked to, they've shared their stories is, that their grief was so isolating mm. and that compounded their suffering. And here's the other thing. And I, I tell people, I get, we complicate this, right? We so complicate it. And I say, here's another thing. Are you ready? Get your pens. Ask. <laughs> Ask. Ask. I, a friend of mine, and here's a perfect scenario. A friend of mine divorced, had to move, leave her home, First, as if that was enough, because grief shows no mercy, right? Sometimes it's compounded. Um, first week, she's in her new house. She falls down the stairs and fractures her back. She's now on bed rest, and she has two little kids. And talk about grief. That's tremendous, complex grief. I went to her house, and I said, listen, I'm here. I'm going to do something. You know I don't cook, so please don't ask me to cook anything. Let's get one of your neighbors to make you uh, <laughs> some food. said, what can I do that would be the most helpful thing for you right now? I can't fix this, but what can I do? And she said, you know, there's something, but I don't want to ask. I said, I'm not leaving until you tell me, like, I need to feel better about myself and feel like I helped. So the, I just showed up. <laughs> this is about me. So how are you going to help me feel good about this? And she said, a dog was in my backyard, ripped over, the, opened the garbage. It smells. It's awful. I can't get it. It's driving me crazy. I said, say no more. I'm getting my rake. <laughs> and I just showed up for her. Mm. Right. I cleaned up my daughter and I actually brought my daughter because I teach my children that they can just show up and make a difference. We cleaned garbage in a backyard. Yes. Now, if people say, oh, I, I, I'm not qualified. Well, the thing is, and here's where a lot of people also don't understand is that, or what they don't understand is even if you need a therapist or a counselor or you know professional help, that's wonderful. <laughs> You may get that for one hour a week. You may get that if you have, you know, someone is in the dying process or has a chronic illness. Maybe you have help a couple hours a day. There's 24 hours in a day. That's where you need your village. Yeah. That's where you need your family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, and caring people to just show up. Because any one of these grief journeys, when we, when we have a village, and we connection is key. When we just show up for each other, we can be a part of that journey. And then all the, the burden isn't on one person trying to do everything. Mm. We can all do a little something. Yvonne, what do you say to the person 
who may be listening to this saying, oh my God, this is awesome. I wish I had heard this five years ago, whatever. What do you say to that person who is maybe now thinking, if only I had shown up for her or him in the past, I didn't, and now I'm dealing with what? Feelings of tremendous guilt. What do you say to that person? Jerry, you just ask the best questions <laughs> because how many of us have been there? We've all been there. I've been there. I look back at times I say, oh gosh, I would have I wish I would have just shown up for this person. And here's the thing. And I even shared this message in my TED talk. If you did not just show up for someone in the past, forgive yourself, grieve, but grieve it, and allow it, feel your feelings, forgive yourself and do better next time. And it is never too late to call and say, you know what? I am so sorry I didn't show up for you 10 years ago. This is kind of haunting me. I feel awful. I wish that I would have had the courage to just show up. This is what I would have done. I actually wrote that in my book when I when I, I, I wrote about this boy who had cancer in grade 11, we all avoided, like we didn't know what to do or say, we avoided it. And I said, gosh, I, I would have done it so differently now, you know, with these skills. So forgive yourself and do better next time and talk to the person, reach out. It's never too late to just show up. Oh my God, that is so good. What I've, one of the things that I've discovered through life is that there's three types of pain. There is a pain from the past, as we just talked about, and then there's a pain in the present, which for many people is the most pressing thing, right? What's going on right now, right? And then there's the pain of the future. And that's when someone is dealing with a person who let's say is dying, mm -hmm. right? Because there's that, there's that pain associated with what's coming. That fear of this impending outcome so how do, you, how do you help that person navigate between the past, the present, and the future? The dying process or someone with a chronic illness, an addiction, whatever, it's kind of like anticipatory grief, you know it's coming, and also like chronic grief, right? Chronic grief where someone could have an illness for years. And I would encourage every single person going through or anticipating to really stop right now, just show up for yourself first and have those hard conversations with yourself. Mm -hmm. Write it down. What is the most challenging for me? What do I fear the most? What is coming that I do not, that I am not prepared for? What, what am I most fearful of? And what can you do to change that? Okay. Right? What can you do to change that? To me, this, this whole life grief journey, it, all of it is ongoing learning and developing skills. And here's the other piece that I think is really important that we have to understand is that grief and joy coexist. Okay. Many people feel like, okay, well, like here's the grief and I'm going to get over it. Then I can have joy after it's all said and done. And the truth is that we never get over grief. We just build our new life around it. Mm -hmm. So as you are going through this process, let the joy in, let the love in, bring heart and humor in whenever you can, right? Bring that in, allow it, because grief and joy can coexist and take intentional self-care, just showing up for yourself first, it must be so intentional and bringing in that happiness, right? Mm -hmm. Along this journey. Mm, I love that. Now, does this extend to pets? Because when I think about what I'm hearing, oh my God, I've had in my past, because I'm a pet lover and, you know, I had a couple of cats who passed away, Kai and Sasha, <laughs> Uh, my market director had a dog named Buddy, and she's been a dog lover, and that was hard. And so for the millions of people that are out there, they can hear this for their love of their pets. What, how, do you, how do you make that 
what's the word, that adjustment, I guess, when it's not a human being. What do you say to, to the pet owner? That, that kind of grief is no different than any other heartbreaking, heart-wrenching grief. And it how, funny that you are mentioning this because in every one of my keynotes, I say to people, first of all, we have to not judge other people's grief, right? Like you don't understand. I could have a pet rat that means the world to me. You don't have to like rats. You don't have to understand. <laughs> and when you talk about being a cat lover, when I was a single parent, I I got I did the old, oh, we're just going to go to the um, um, SPCA and we're just going to look with my older son. Isn't that hilarious? Of course, we ended up with a kitten. And that cat was there for me for 16 years. And that cat was a very important part of our journey. So when our cat died and when our, our pets have died, it was a tremendous loss. It is excruciating grief. And so the first thing I say to everyone around, even if you don't understand someone grieving an animal, just we don't need to judge people's grief. When I wrote my book, our pug was dying. And I sat there and said, oh my gosh, I am writing this book about living well, grieving well, dying well, and I am falling apart. I am falling apart. So love, love, love your pets and know. I think it's very important to know that you can love another pet again. I've heard people say, I'll never love another dog. My dog was the only one. And again, allowing that, that joy to come in and allow your grief because our animals are part of, parts of our family. They are, as in, they are important members of our family. And to love them, love them, love them. I've heard people say, if my dog dies, and I said, okay, so we need to choose our language. It, language is important. I said, that is a when, not if. We are all a when, not an if, right? <laughs> like, let's, we, we try to push it away when your dog dies. And I feel like it's important to know, okay, so I have this kind of dog. We just, we just adopted a rescue. She is a Wheaton Poodle Terrier mix. The first thing I did was she's this age. How long can we anticipate having her so that we prepare our hearts, right, for what is coming? But isn't it so wonderful to love pets and allow them in our hearts and know that when your pet dies, you'll have a little scar? I, I told my kids, my kids have been a part of this journey. They held our cat until her final breath. They held our dog, our pug. We allow our tremendous grief together and we sobbed and we grieved and I teach my children and I learn that your heart feels so broken like it will never heal and then there'll be a little Frankie scar and with each person that dies or pet there will be a little scar and your, he your heart will heal. Battered, scarred and never the same but it will heal if we learn to take better care of ourselves and each other and let love back in. I appreciate that. I think you just helped me because I've never, um, I don't think I've ever forgiven myself. When, <gasps> yeah. Okay, Jerry, we're going to have to talk. <laughs> we have to have the talk. Well, that, that, you know, because I, I related to what you just said because I remember taking her to the vet when um, I had to say goodbye to her. So, yeah. Thank you. And just so you know, I have to make at least one person a day cry. So, I mean, you know, if you have tears, thank you, because then I can check off for today. Um, <laughs> do you know, and I will help you, when our black lab, our, our beautiful Kuba, he, could, he was having trouble walking. He had these big tumors. He was a mess. And... It, that was after I read my, wrote my book and, you know, I'm the grief expert. I said, no, nobody's an expert at this. It's challenging for everyone. I had to call the vet and I was, hysteri I was hysterical on the phone. I don't want to murder my dog. <laughs> I was like, I can't just murder my dog because he has tumors. And I was a disaster. Oh, my God. It's never easy. It's right. never easy. And they were so consoling. They said, is your dog enjoying the things in life that he used to? And I said, no, he is not. Is he able to catch a ball and eat? And I said, no, he is not. And then she said, then I think you know your answer. I said, I know I do. I'm just really sad. <laughs> it's hard. 
hard. But it's what, hard. What you're getting to, which is really good, is within this whole conversation of grief and loss, what's coming up for me is the question that I think we end up asking ourselves, could I have done something? Oh. You know? And then there's, word, and, and, and there's another word that it could be better or different or whatever, right? Could I have done something? And that, and that, that adds to the grief. And then if you throw in people in your life who may then go like this, finger point and say, you, you should have done something differently. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of layers of this stuff you're doing. There's so many layers. And but see, this is why I urge people to have talk about plan and prepare for grief, death and dying long before it arrives, long before it arrives. This happens with family members when they're dying and everyone has a different idea about what should happen. And families are fractured beyond repair because Mom wanted to be buried. No, we should have. She was cremated. Why did you do that? You don't get that money. Why do you get that ring? And people at a time we should be grieving and loving and supporting one another are feuding over a blunder, are feuding over a house. Mm -hmm. And it is something that, again, creating excessive suffering. And, you know, here's the thing about looking back and saying, I wish I would have done this differently. I could have done this. Maybe sometime that's true, right? People say, oh, no, you did the best you could. Maybe you could have done something differently. And, you know, here's the thing. We can't change the past, can we? There is not a thing. We're not magic. We cannot change the past. So I say to people, if truly you feel that, I mean, I have a lot, I've talked to a lot of parents when their children have died from an opioid overdose. Now you want to talk about excruciating grief and guilt and I should have seen it and I should have done something to prevent this. I say, allow, sit in that horribleness of all those excruciating emotions, feel them, they're raw, they're awful. And then we can move forward and say, yes, I wish I would have done this. And now I'm going to do something differently. Wow. wow. And now I'm going to make myself cry. <laughs> See, well, you can laugh and cry because it's sad sometimes. It's sad. This is hard stuff. Is and that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Because it opens up wounds. It opens oh. up stuff from God knows how many years back, people have tried to put under underneath a rug or put a Band-Aid over it. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's a lumpy rug, Jerry, it's I a just, lumpy it's, rug. It's a lumpy rug, and so, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'm not trying to laugh, but. You have to laugh, you, know, you gotta, gotta laugh. Almost 20 years, I mean, <laughs> my poor little cat, you know. Your poor cat, 20 years, and you still haven't forgiven yourself, <laughs> Jerry, jeez. But You're only human. I know, I know, but I'm feeling better now, actually, <laughs> talking to you. <laughs> there, I've done what I meant to do. It's actually a great segue into the other thing I want to acknowledge you about that I want to hear you share something about, which is, you're creating a movement. You're creating a whole culture of change. Tell us about the I Just Showed Up community because you believe that together we can create a culture of change. Share about that, please. Absolutely. The truth when, yes, this is, I haven't taken on anything light, that's for sure. When we're talking about a movement and a global movement, we need to create social change where we talk about plan and prepare before, where we allow grief, understand that grief and joy coexist. We can bring heart and humor. We need different perspectives, different stories. Everyone has different experience. And so I just, I'm so, I feel so honored and privileged. I feel like I, people say, why did you choose to talk about this? I said, I think it chose me. Like who would, who would do this? Yes. But I get to gather people. I have spoken to people who have been in the deepest trenches of grief, who have been through the most incredible traumas and tragedies and created something good purpose 
something positive from that. And I mean, the, the, the number one, I always go to my beautiful friend, Eva Olson, who is 95 and she survived the Holocaust. Now, when we talk about, right, like just the most excruciating grief in the world and she became a beautiful light and, and a change maker and she speaks. So I think when, if Eva was able to do that, that gives the rest of us hope. So when I gather people and, and share their stories, I share them with my radio show and my blogs and my television show and in my book, and I get to do this. And the other thing, so with um, the other, with Love Your Life to Death, I just want it to be this community and this I Just Showed Up movement where anyone can come to. We can all just show up for each other and learn from one another, mm -hmm. right? And I continue, I've created resources for people to who everybody learns in different ways and and depending on what you're going through so i have my book and my audio book and my program get ready for grief so that people have different things that will help them along this way and always very coachable which is why it's wonderful to connect to like experts like yourself because when you are creating a big global brand, you need to you need to be open to learning and okay, this is bigger than me. This is more important than my own ego or how I think things should be. And that's that's when I know I am I am ready and creating social change. And I didn't even know a global pandemic was coming when I started this, and that is global grief, isn't it? Oh my God. Literally affecting every person in this world. Incredible. I mean, everyone is grieving something. It's, it's unbelievable. So we really need to connect in a very meaningful way and have a positive impact, raise the vibration and really connect intentionally and help each other just show up for each other now more than ever. Oh my goodness. Well, that is a, a great way to, to close this conversation. And there is an expression which is many are called, but few are chosen. And you clearly have mm -hmm. been chosen to do this work. And thank you. The lives of many have been entrusted with you. And so I salute you for that. And Godspeed for what you were doing. And you mentioned the pandemic. You must be one busy person right now because there's a whole lot of loss and grief. What's going on? <laughs> oh my! There God. is, and and again, when I say to everyone, when they say, "What can I do?" Just show up. Just show up. Keep shining your light. And if your light is dim, if you are struggling, reach out to someone else and say, "And show help up. here." You got the little bracelets, right? I just showed up bracelet. Do you have one on? You got to show our Oh, always. Here you go. I, I need to say, yes. The I, and this, this, this reminder, and it comes with a little card, and this little card, and I'm always happy to send anyone a bracelet. If they want to email me, I'll send them one. Because you need those reminders to just show up for yourself first and just show up for each other. We can do this. We can do better. Let's create a better world on the other side of this. Absolutely. So, for our viewers out there and listeners, I hope that you have just enjoyed this invigorating conversation. I know I have. And to learn more about Yvonne and the work that she does, be sure to come to my website, jerryfosterbranding.com, go to the podcast page and you can find this interview with Yvonne and all her contact information, her website, so that you can connect with her, find out about the amazing work that she's doing, her talks, her books, her blogs, her radio show, oh my God. She is being used in a mighty way. And so Yvonne, again, bless you, bless you, bless you for who you are and what you do. And for our viewers out there, thank you for tuning in. This is Jerry Foster, the Brandon Evangelist saying, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Don't settle for any ordinary brand. Let Jerry Foster, the branding evangelist, show you how to have a world-class brand here on Big Brand Formula. No more spinning your wheels, wondering what it takes to have a great brand that can have great things happen for you. Jerry wants you to think big and go big. 
Through his interviews and inspiring teachings, each episode is devoted to giving you the guidance, support, and tools for big branding your business, product, or a service, or even yourself as a personal brand. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Jerry Foster. Jerry Foster. 